Welcome to Ghostly. Was the Perrin family home haunted? As always, we're your host. I'm Pat. (laughs) And I'm Rebecca. Ghostly is a podcast that examines a ghost story from all angles. We go over the history and various evidence of the ghost story. Then we let you, the listener, decide if it's real or not. So today's episode is going to be huge. But uh, we do have business to cover before we get to the episode. Mm. So Rebecca, do we have any listener mail? Of course we do. Oh, I want to hear it. Okay, okay. How's your week been? Are, are you doing okay? Uh, I am virus-free right now. Okay. Well, so not all, probably. I probably have some virus, but not the virus, right? Gotcha, gotcha. I just wanted to check in. Do you? Uh, not that I know of. I keep checking my temperature, though, Ooh. just to be sure. Like, how often are you checking in your temperature? Well, I guess I checked it earlier this week because I had, like, a scare moment, but th- I was whoa, fine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, wait scare moment yeah like i felt flush for some reason and so then i went and i took my temperature and it was um so wait wait 98.6 is normal yeah i was like 97.9 or something like that so i was so you're dying right that's what you're saying pretty much you're you're becoming the undead i think so wow (laughs) well that that is not the podcast for this that would be our walking dead that's our walking dead podcast which if any of our listeners listen to walking dead just in case you don't know pat and i also do a Walking Dead fan cast. Where which can is they find that? Weirdly appropriate right now. Um, <laughs> they can find it anywhere they find good podcasts. Uh, it's just search the Walking Dead podcast D V M P E. Oh, because that's the network. The M P E is the is yeah. the network. The D V M Production Empire. All right. So okay. Let's okay. Get listener, to the listener mail. mail. Listener mail. Woo. Okay. Here we go. Um, all right. So this is another uh, listener mail from our Ghostly Society Facebook group. So if you haven't joined, this is the time. Just search Ghostly Society on Facebook yeah. and uh, join. Just- yeah, it's it's a lot of fun there. I mean, seriously, I enjoy seeing other people like interact on, on these same topics and use the same critical thinking that we've been going over. Yes, because they'll be like, hey, this is something that happened to me. What do you guys think? And then people kind of debate it. It's well, I'm, it's a lot of fun. I'm especially proud of the moments when people are like, you know, I used to just be a straight up believer in all this, but now I question it. And I usually still come up to be a believer, but I take time to think about it yeah, first. That's and a that good thing. is that makes me proud. Me too. Me yeah. too. Yeah. All right. So this is one of our uh, top listeners, Whitney. Oh, okay. Top listener. She is our top. Whitney is awesome. She is awesome. And she's always posting and got a lot of fun stuff. Um, So she says, uh, Pat, you will probably have a field day with this. Uh. Uh My friend and roommate, by the way, she did get permission from the roommate, but that's it took us a few weeks before we we could read this. Okay. Uh, Her roommate goes by the name of Rabbit. Rabbit. Okay. Has like, been... is it an actual rabbit or is it a uh, no, roommate named just rabbit? A person named, nicknamed rabbit. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm fine with that. All right. Has been seeing and hearing things his entire life. He mm. has many stories, but one in particular is still ongoing from when he was a child. He believes that he is being plagued by a mis- mischievous spirit that he is named Bob. Oh, I, I am too. Yeah. By a Bob Anderson from Bob After Dark. He's a mischievous spirit that just plagues you. He keeps putting these microclimate ideas in my head, you know? Yeah. Uh, over the years, Bob has made his presence known to all of us. Rabbit claims he frequently moves things to a place where they should not be. For example, Rabbit used to smoke an old-fashioned tobacco pipe. He always placed it in his bedside drawer and in his nightstand before going to sleep. One morning, he woke up and it was no longer there. Rabbit searched all over his room, but he could not find it anywhere. I needed to go into Rabbit's room to borrow a cord to charge my phone as my cord had to shorten it, and I would not be able to get to the store until much later. 
I well, once nowadays you can't get to the store at all. Well, no, yeah, this was yeah. You can tell this is a this is a dated story. <laughs> that was when we could go out in public. <laughs> we could go to stores. Uh, I went searching for it because I normally do not go into his room and have no idea where he normally puts things, even though he's meticulous about where things are put so he can find them quickly when he wakes up. That sounds like you, Pat. I couldn't find it in any of the spots I thought were obvious, so I looked in the drawer under the foot of his bed. There was his pipe. When he got home, I told him I found the pipe and where, where, and he just looked at me confused. He never uses that drawer for anything, and his door stays locked due to past issues with things going missing from his room, so no one besides him, myself, or my husband could have moved it, and none of us did. Bob also seems to get frustrated with my husband. My hubby is firmly on the hashtag schemes team skeptic side. Oh, I like her husband. Uh huh. This is despite <laughs> the fact that Bob throws things at John from time to time, especially if we have been talking about him recently. And John has voiced his opinion that he does not believe Bob exists. Normally, a short, uh, short while after this declaration, something that John has placed down near himself will fall to the floor. Once it was a plate of spaghetti that he had put at the back of the wide of a wide dresser that was against the wall everyone in the room was more than an arm's length away and it fell off in front of the dresser face down we know it didn't just fall off the edge because the dresser was much wider than the plate also there were no animals in the room at the time because we were eating and the door was closed to keep them out wow sounds very mischievous yeah poltergeisty Definitely. And the Bob thing really rings true to me. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think Bob, you know, senses psychic powers to like knock plates of spaghetti off my ah. my dresser too. You have often things missing. You blame yeah, Bob. And, and I like to put spaghetti on my dresser. I, I think that is the appropriate place for spaghetti. It is the appropriate place. Yeah. I mean, like table, no. Dresser, yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so there's our listener mail today. So yeah. that's exciting. If you have listener mail. Send it on over yeah. to info at ghostlypodcast.com. Or you could message us on any of the socials. You got it. Facebook, Insta. Insta? Insta. I just call it IG. The gram. I call it IG. IG. Like yeah. the OG? Yeah. Or, twi- or the tweets. The tweets. <laughs> the Twitters. Yeah. That place too. Yes. You could send it anywhere or you could even go on our website, ghostlypodcast.com, and you can click on the contact us button and there's a form right there you just fill out. There you go. Easy. Send it off. Easy peasy. It is definitely. Well, I want to thank Whitney for sending that in. That was a very good story. Yes. Lots of fun. So, um, yeah. So now we have the history and the debate and then we're going to close this out. Uh, I think you're missing one thing. Actually, I'm, I'm not missing anything. That. I'm not missing anything. So. Uh, we got to talk about the polls, my no, friend. No, yep, no. time for the polls. I, I actually pulled the numbers, so I know what it is. So we don't need to talk about <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, we do. Now, we should we mention a little bit about where the polls are? Or do you mean yes. do before I give you what the, the yeah, answer so, is? So uh, we were putting it on our Facebook page where we get a pretty good response usually. Um, we were happy that we were getting so many responses. Uh, but Facebook decided because of the election or maybe coronavirus, I don't know, <laughs> we can no longer do polls on a page. And it's really random too. It's like sometimes you're able to post something, sometimes I am, or this time neither of us really could. The page though, the page, the we page never. We, no, no, I to. was able to. Oh yeah, up until a certain I mean, point. After yeah. that point, now they're done. Yeah. So in our uh, ghostly society. We can post a poll sometimes. Yes. So we will do that. We will continue to do that. So join the Ghostly Society. Uh, also, we decided that wasn't enough because that's, you know. We want this to be for everyone. Yeah. So we put it up on ghostlypodcast.com. Yep. And you could just click on the polls button and it's right there or on the show note page. I will absolutely have a link right at the beginning, I'm thinking. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be a link. It could be the poll. Well, they could vote right on that page. Too. Oh, how fancy is this? Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. So. All right. So here we go. Yeah, not, we don't. Yeah. No, we no, no. We still have to, oh. to give the results. So uh, our votes are. This is very precise. Uh, 76.92. Uh, yes. The site of the old Chicago City Cemetery is haunted. Hmm. And 23.08 percent said no. Wow. Well, um, it is very precise, and we added, I added in all of the you votes. You did math? No, 
I put it in the pro in the web page. Ah. It did it for us. Nice, nice. I hated to do it though. Yeah. And I even counted one that was in the comments. Nice. I could have just ignored that one. You could have. But I didn't. That was nice. I put it in there. <laughs> it was nice, but I lost. I lost badly. But you know what? I really enjoyed doing that episode. It was super fun. We were, that was that was the last time we'll ever be in a large group of people <laughs> for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. So if you didn't meet up with us at the meetup, you might never see us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll be like behind glass. Or right. Something. Maybe yeah. that. Yeah. We'll be like the Pope of a yeah. Pope mobile. Yeah. We'll have the ghostly mobile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about what this episode is going to be about. In this episode, we are going to be going over the story behind The Conjuring, which is the Perrin family story. Yes. We're also going to talk a little bit about Ed and Lorraine Warren Mm -hmm. as they relate to the story, although this is not a Ed and Lorraine episode, but I think we should do that. Well, I do, but I also feel like they have so many individual stories that I want to like, maybe we could do like a month. They have a werewolf story. They do. We got to get Bob to do that one. Yeah. Well, and we're going to do the Enfield hauntings at some point, and they're a big part of it. Well, no, actually, they're not a big part of that. They're just a little part of that. But that, that's in The Conjuring 2, right? That's The Conjuring 2, yeah. Yeah, well, I heard that that was totally debunked. But actually, yeah, I would love to do that. Definitely not. But anyway, I would love so, to do that. Yeah. But yes, we will be, Ed and Lorraine Warren are going to show up a lot, and maybe they'll get their own episode at some point. Yeah. So how did you come about the parent story? Uh, the movie, actually. Okay. Yeah, I did not know about it before that. Uh, I saw the movie, and at the end of the movie, it says this is based on a real story, and so yes. then I, I went and I read about it. I think up until um, 2007 or so, it was more of a local story. There were some local uh, newspaper articles, yes. things like that in the 70s. Yeah, there was one Yeah, from 77 that yeah. I actually put in here, too. Good. Um, so, yeah. So, I believe up until then, it was a really, like, localized story. Uh, I had never heard of this story, and I had never watched the movie. I don't get it. <laughs> so, I mean, I am coming into this totally, totally blind. I had no idea what to expect. I didn't even know what the movie was about. Tell you yeah. the truth. I mean, I can kind of figure out the conjuring, you know, they're bringing forth something, you know, that's what it means to me. The name doesn't necessarily match the movie to me, but that's okay. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, I agree. Well, originally the movie was going to be called the, um, the Warren Files. Ah. Yeah. And that's what they were going to do, but then they decided to go a different direction. Yeah. Because not everyone had heard of the Warrens. Right. And I mean, there's a lot of movies, the Annabelle movies, the nun, you know, a lot of movies that are all kind of part of that, but they all kind of spread out a little bit further than just the Warrens. Yeah. Now I had heard of the Warrens um, before watching this. So when I saw that, it all kind of connected in. They are responsible for what? Amityville? Yeah. They were the first people that Mm -hmm. started talking about that. That's on our list too. Yeah. amongst, Amongst other really big stories too. Um, but I found it a little hard to do research for this story, um, especially versus all of our other stories. Like all of our other stories, you know, you can get an account of the history of the story. And this is what I do, the history part, right? So I found it actually kind of difficult to find what I was looking for because everything um, was a paranormal site that did it, which, you know, that's fine. And that's uh, some of what I took from, and I always do, but I find that that sways one way all the time. Yeah, you like more neutral sources. Yeah, neutral or, uh, I hate to say this, but the skeptic sites tend to have more the history Mm -hmm. and then the skeptical parts. Right, right. So it's easier for me to dissect what I'm looking for. Um, So anyways, but I was able to eventually find what I was looking for, and I am so excited about this episode. I've been thinking about it um, for a while, and I am pumped. Me too. I mean, this is one of my favorite movies. I love the whole series. I've seen, I think, all of them. Though I didn't realize uh, La Llorona, I think is the name of it, just came out, and I didn't realize that was actually also connected to this series. So Yes, and, and Bob has actually challenged us to do something with The Conjuring 3. Mm. I forget the the premise behind that. I think it was The Devil Made Me Do It yes. concept. We will get to that. It's just not going to be for a little while because we have a bunch more things to talk about. And the movie's not out yet. 
Yeah, exactly. So, Rebecca, do you have a ghost story I for do, us? I do, I um, do. All right. So this is uh, the diary of, uh, well, well, let me just read it. New house day. We're moving into a new house. Mama says it's going to be bigger than where we live now and that it will have a huge yard where we can all play. I'm so excited. Day two in our new house. It's so much fun. I only have to share my room with one of my sisters instead of three of us in a room. And there is so much room to run around and play hide and go seek and everything. The yard is even bigger than Mama said. I can't wait to play tag out there. Day 30 in our new house. It's been a lot of fun. Day, today, Daddy made pancakes for breakfast because he's home for two days in a row. The only thing that's weird is that the doors, they keep opening and closing. Everyone keeps asking which one of us is doing it, and then they always end up blaming me as the youngest, but I swear it's not me. Day 42, and I've made a new friend. His name is Oliver Richardson. He's really fun to talk to because he always talks kind of funny and talks about things that I don't even know what they are. He says they are all from back when he was a kid, but like he still is a kid. He's so silly. (laughs) He likes to play with my toys. Sometimes he'll push a ball back and forth with me or we'll have a tea party. The funniest part is that he lives in my closet. I don't know why. (laughs) One day I just opened the door and there he was. He dresses funny too. He looks like the old pictures I see in books. Today was weird though because... Uh, Mama came in while we were having a tea party and she couldn't see Oliver. She just came in and asked who I was talking to. And when I said Oliver she and pointed to him, she acted like I was making it up. Though I'm confused. When she came in the room to talk to me more, Oliver disappeared. And I couldn't find him later when I looked in the closet. I hope he didn't get scared away. Day 45 and Oliver is back. He was gone for the last three days no matter how much I called for him. But tonight after dinner, when I looked in my closet, he was there. I asked him why he left, and he said he was scared of my mama. His mama wasn't very nice, I guess, and he doesn't want to play with anyone but me. So I made a promise that I won't tell anyone else about him. Cross my heart and hope to die. They might scare him away, and I don't want that. He'll be my friend forever. Oh, wow. So is that actually a diary, or did you write that? I wrote that. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's based on a claim yeah. yes. by the youngest. Um, and also, I mixed in some of the movie in there, too, just for just inspiration. For fun. for fun. Yeah. Yeah. We should probably take a break, right, before we get into the history? I think that's probably a good idea. History might be a little confusing, but uh, we're going to cover it all when we come back. Oh, hey there, Count Panic. I got a question for you. What's that, Bob? What do you know about Mothman, the Loch Ness Monster, ghosts, demons, and things that go bump in the night? Not much, Bob. Well, lucky for you, we host a podcast called Bob After Dark, where we talk about legends, lore, and the supernatural. Wow, where can I find this podcast? Wherever you find your great podcasts at. All right, so uh, let's take a look at the history. Let's do it. To me, the most logical part to start with this story is different from the movie itself. Uh, The movie, it starts with uh, Ed and Lorraine. Yes. And uh, that doll, Mm -hmm. Annabelle, which was a rag doll, right? Raggedy Ann doll. Raggedy Ann doll, which, uh, you know, again, yet another future (laughs) concept we might have to talk about. Maybe, yeah. I would be open to that. That one definitely needs Bob on it, though, because he loves spooky dolls. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 This is a really Bob-focused episode. I I know, right? We keep... (laughs) Yeah. We keep mentioning Bob. Yeah. And Bob's not here. And Bob gets sensitive about those things too, because he takes it all as a challenge. He does. Yeah. yeah so he who does. knows? He might be inspired to do his own conjuring episode. Or he might have already done one. I, I don't, don't know. know. All right. So I don't listen to that guy. <laughs> I do. <laughs> uh anyways, so we're gonna start with the Perrin family and the Harrisville hauntings. Uh when I refer to the Perrin family, I am talking about Roger and Carolyn. And their five daughters, which are Andrea, or sometimes known as Annie, depending upon her age. Like when she was younger, it was Annie, I think. Uh, Nancy, Christine, Cindy, and April. There's a story. <laughs> they had a lot. Of, they had a lot of 
kids. They like girls. Yeah, five girls. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, the Perrin family bought the Harrisville farmhouse or the old Arnold estate, depending upon who you talk to, uh, in December of 1970. They didn't actually move in until January of 71 because Carolyn refused to move in during Christmas. Understandable. Yeah, definitely, right? She wanted her kids to have a Christmas. Um, but they wanted to give their children a quieter, more peaceful childhood. <laughs> I, I think they accomplished uh, uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is in Rhode Island? Rhode Island, yeah. Right. So the old Arnold estate was one of the original plantations in the area and had over 200 acres of land attached to, and, and it was like an older fix em, fix em upper or farmhouse kind of place. Now, did they own all that land? I believe that they owned a large chunk of that okay. land, though. So um, the original lot, though, much bigger, mm. and it was surveyed by uh, colonist John Smith in 1680. So it goes back pretty wow. far, right? Yeah. Uh, and it was deeded originally to Roger Williams for the formation of the state of Rhode, Rhode Island. Wow. It's like yeah. the whole state. Well, I mean, they had to section off ah, parts of it. So okay. I'm sure it was part of a big package Interesting. Of, of lots. Hmm. Uh, the farmhouse, which actually started rather small, it, it, you really can't find too much about this, um, but it started off rather small and and they just kept adding on to it. Gotcha. Uh, it expanded several times and became a spacious 10-room country house. You know, some would say it had like a charming feel to it. There you go. Uh, the first part of the house was built in 1736. So that is really old. It is really old and it's still standing. That's crazy. You know, I always find it so weird that different parts of the country and different parts of the world perceive um, time as as totally different things. Like... That sounds really old for us. I mean, that us. is crazy old in the United States. Yeah, so. well, especially because we're from the Midwest, which really didn't settle until the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And then going um, beyond that, then, um, you know, you think of England and right. stuff. They would think that this is pretty modern. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a modern dwelling. Yep. Um, so Nancy and Christine Perrin shared a bedroom, and Cindy and April shared another room. And Andrea, the eldest daughter... Had her own room. There you go. Seems fair, right? Yep. Uh, Andrea did do a lot of the um, caretaking for the younger ones. No, yeah, not surprising. <laughs> well, I mean, we're going to get into it, but uh, as it went on, Carolyn became weaker and weaker. Yeah. yeah. In the interviews that I've seen with her, she definitely, you know, you could tell that she's had a lot of trauma in her life. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Perrin family claimed to have had spirits in the house their entire 10 years that they lived there. But the major events that were showcased in the movie transpired over the first three years. And during this time, Ed and Lorraine Warren investigated the house for about like a year or so. You know, they actually like in the movie, it looked like they lived in the house. Like they moved in for a few days. Yeah, that that was not the case. Right. They were just going to and from there whenever they, you know, had things that they wanted to try. Uh, some of the ghosts that were reported were friendly ghosts, uh, some watching over the kids as they played, and another would kiss the children's head before they went to sleep. Seems nice, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. And one even would sweep up the kitchen when no one was looking. Now, that's a ghost I need. It's kind of like a, um, an old-time Roomba. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's what I want is a yeah, ghost Roomba. <laughs> ghost Roomba. In Andrea Perrin's book, um, which, were, which was a trilogy called House of Darkness, The House of Light, which I really like that name because, it, mm -hmm. you know, like the interviews that I watched, and I did a lot of research on this episode, Yeah, you more keep... so than, you know, than typical. Oh, yeah. Like you kept like coming to me and be like, okay, okay, okay. Like, yeah. here's some new stuff, or like, yeah. here's here's what I found. Like, yeah, sending yeah. me stuff. Like, yeah, yeah well, I mean, lot. yeah, I did more so than usual, and I used a lot of different um, medias to to research this, and um, I really thought that that was a fitting name for it because she did say that there were a lot of good times in the house, too. Yes. Uh, so they were there for 10 years, by the way. Yes, 10 years. Yeah. Um, so those books were released between 2011 and 2014, 
And also in the 2013 movie named The Conjuring, they discuss the house's dark history. So some, I'm just going to summarize because, as we're going to find out, maybe some of the dates weren't exactly accurate sure. and stuff. So it, it would be hard for me to do a complete history of so that. So this is what the history is in the movie or in her books? Both. Okay. Both. They're both based upon the same kind of thing. So this is what they say the history is. Y- and this then is you what... might play with, or talk yeah, about it. Then. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Okay, so they say that eight generations of families had lived and died in the old Arnold estate. This is going to get kind of dark for okay. you people. Uh, if yep. if um, death or suicide are triggers for you, please fast forward ahead like... A minute or two. Maybe five tops. Okay. So... Um, including Miss John Arnold, who at the age of 93 hung herself in the barn. Rafters, you know, she hung gotcha. herself in the rafters wow. in the barn. Um, so they talk about several more suicides from hangings and poisonings, a rape and a murder of an 11-year-old girl, Prudence Arnold. There were, were supposedly two drownings in the creek located next to the house, and four men, two to four men, uh, supposedly froze to death on the land, as well as a witch with satanic connections named, and spoiler alert to anybody that hasn't seen The Conjuring, if you hope to see The Conjuring, you might not want to listen. For oh, that. yeah, we did forget to do the spoiler warning. I yeah. mean, but hopefully if you're listening to an episode called The Conjuring, you realize there might be spoilers, but yeah. in case we hadn't yet. So the I like witch, how you capitalize witch and satanic connections. Well, I was a witch, so to me that would be a capital. I guess that with the satanic connections makes yeah. it very scary looking. <laughs> so a witch with satanic connections, uh, which I don't know too many witches that have satanic connections, just to put it out there. Sure. Um, she was named Bathsheba. Bathsheba Sherman or Green. Uh, who sacrificed all of her children, one with a sewing needle, to the brain. Ugh. Right? Uh, she did this to gain power. Bathsheba was said to have hung herself from a tree behind the barn. That's a big focal point in the movie, right? Yeah, it's super freaky. And it was a focal point in um, Andrea's books as well, mm-hmm. that that tree was especially something with it. Bathsheba was said to lust after Roger and therefore hate Carolyn. The wife. The wife. Gotcha. Yeah. So there's just a lot of names in here. So there I'm, is a lot of I, names. I have to always remind myself, like, okay, Carolyn's like an adult in this situation. <laughs> By the way, Bathsheba sounds like the scariest name the ever. Scariest name ever. Just I... the name alone gives me a little bit of chills. Yeah. Right. Do not want to meet that person. <laughs> um, an August 1977 article in the local Providence Journal describes the appearance of Bathsheba. Miss Perrin said she awoke before dawn one morning to find an apparition by her bed, the head of an old woman hanging off to one side over an old gray dress. There was a voice reverberating, Get out. Get out. I'll drive you out with death and gloom. (laughs) (laughs) That's a little scary, huh? Yes. Um. So at some time when the Warrens were involved, there was a seance. And uh, the movie portrays this more as an exorcism. Actually says it's an exorcism. Yes. That Ed was not allowed to actually do an exorcism, but he did one. Yes. Um, And it was like a big thing. Like, you know, he had um, participated in them, but he's never done one. Mm -hmm. He was like an assistant. Right. But he finally got his chance, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, so in the movie, it all worked out, right? Yes. In Andrea's accounts, it just happened and it passed. Yeah. It, like nothing worked its way out. Mm-hmm. It just was, was over. That major event was over. But she also said that um, when the Warrens were there, that things just got worse. Yeah. So not having the Warrens there after that event might have cooled things down a little bit. Yeah. Well, and it was interesting in the movie, the Warren character, the the two uh, characters actually say like, "Hey, we find that when we're around, the the um, experiences tend to increase the incidents because they yes. get turned up by us being here." So I guess that's how they they dealt with that in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. 
And the home was sold a couple times uh, since the parents. It was owned by Norma Sutcliffe, the longest uh, owner of the house that we know of. I mean, the Arnold family owned it forever, but since the parents. Mm -hmm. Um, But then resold it on June 21st, 2019. So this is pretty current. Yeah, pretty recent. Yeah. um, To Corey and Jennifer Heinzen. And according to Andrea Perrin, Norma had several sightings. And the now current owners, Corey and Jennifer, are actually ghost hunters and believe the house to be an important piece of paranormal history. There you go. All right. I think maybe one more break. Okay. One more break. And then let's get into this debate because there's a lot to get to. Yes. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar, host of Weird Darkness, where I share stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Recently named one of the best storytellers in podcasting for 2019 by Podcast Business Journal. Whether it's ghosts, cryptids, True crime or creepy pastas, you'll find it all in Weird Darkness. Episodes uploaded seven days a week. Search for Weird Darkness in your favorite podcast app or listen now at WeirdDarkness.com. So we're back. Um, usually, Rebecca, you do the whole debate. You present your evidence. I do. And then I try to just refute it, right? Yeah. Uh, today, would you mind if I start the debate? Because I have something that I want to say about my own history. Wow. Okay. Just this once. Just this once. Okay. <laughs> so I happened to find an amazing article by Kenny Beidel from December 2019 on Skeptical Inquirer. Ah. I definitely have to subscribe to that. Yes, you do. Yeah. You found Um, your people. I did. I found my people. No, you know what? A lot of times uh, skeptics are a little bit too harsh for me. Mm. Sorry, skeptic bros, but I like to do things with kindness a little bit. Okay. Uh, So anyways, um, he corrects a lot of the history of the house. And after reading it, I came up with a, a, a concept of what might have transpired. Ooh, this so, is Pat's theory of the case. Yeah, so I believe that Carolyn Perrin came up with the connection to Bathsheba. Bathsheba Sherman, Green, whatever you want to call her. Uh, Green was because she got remarried after, after her, her husband died. Okay. Um. And I believe that the Warrens discovered the dark history of the Arnold's family house using the Black Book of Burrville. Burrville? Which was like, yeah, Burrville. Yeah, which was like the town kind of around Harrisburg or yeah, whatever, it was, right? It was yeah, like, the town that incorporated it. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was part of it. There you go. Yeah. Um, they use that as a reference. So the book is about unusual deaths in the area. Uh, so, you know, they've listed off every single thing in there that could possibly be, uh, this is a book that they would have had, had at the time because of their strong connection with the paranormal community in the area. Okay. So you don't know that they had this book, but you're just thinking that they, they must've, they must have Okay, because of some of the things that they got wrong. Gotcha. So in the article, Kenny goes over Bathsheba and the Arnold's family. So some, some key things to note. One of the things that was talked about is Miss John Arnold. She's one of the bigger ones. This is the woman that hung herself at the age of 93. Um, So there were actually two stories, two different women. One of them was a woman who hung herself, and one was a woman that had a stroke. 
the one that hung herself was 50 years old, not 93, because that that age, like I was like, man, that it's a it would be a lot of work to to hang yourself, especially in a barn. Yeah, especially in a barn. So for a 93 year old woman to get that all going, it would have been, you know, it would have taken a lot. And um, supposedly there was a lot of other things she could have used at that time. Sure. So it was a 50 year old woman though that mm-hmm. did it. And had no connection to the parent parent family home. The other one was ninety three year old, and she died of old age at the parent home. Gotcha. And the reason why we know this too is there was an account of how um, John Arnold actually broke in to find his wife hang hung, mm-hmm. and hang. um, hanged did hanged did hanging <laughs> hung. No, they don't. You don't say hung for a person. Oh, okay. Hanged. Hanged. She yeah. She found it hanged. Okay. Thank you, English professor. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. Um, so um, he had to like go through these windows and do this thing, which wouldn't have been possible at the parent family home and would have been possible at the house that was a couple miles away. So that's how they know that one. Uh, John Arnold, the husband that supposedly drank poison to kill himself in the parent family home, uh, he did kill himself by drinking a poisonous substance, and that substance is under question because there's two different accounts of what the substance was, but does it really matter? Um, but it was it was at his home in Tarklin, which was several miles away. Uh, so another thing, sorry, I know this is a lot to give you at one time. Do yeah. you want to go over those things first? Or? No, I think my response is going to be more like an all the over. Whole? Okay. <laughs> Andrea Perrin also claims there were mysterious deaths of two to four men in the house by freezing underneath a blacksmith shop. The two men that could be found in the um, black book and were the official accounts of these kind of deaths found are Edwin Arnold and Jarvis Smith. Edwin Arnold died in 1903 while walking home, and it appears he had been walking across farms and took a shortcut home. He had laid down to rest. I don't know why you'd rest in a shortcut home. I was just going to say, definitely do not ever do that in the cold. (laughs) But it it was probably a very far distance that would have taken days to get to. Um, Well, during that time when he rested, he ended up dying in his sleep, and then he froze over seven weeks that it took the people to find him. And in 1901, there was Jarvis Smith, who was found dead in a shed. Dead in a shed, it kind of <laughs> rhymes. <laughs> that it, but that shed was torn down before the parents moved in. So, Well, that doesn't mean that he couldn't be haunting. I know, but I'm just saying. Uh, that was in, eight, or in 1901. Um, in 1898, he was on trial for the murder of a Britain Rounds. I don't know what that is. I'm assuming a person. Maybe, yeah. But but he was acquitted of all charges. Okay. Um, so he was drinking and decided he wanted to rest in the shed, which was over 200 feet from the house. Um, he died in his sleep again. And there was no blacksmith shop. There was no reference to this black, blacksmith shop. So, I mean, to me, those are not mysterious. That's what I'm saying. Gotcha. Um, then Prudence Arnold. The very sad story of Prudence Arnold, you know, the one that um, was raped and murdered at the age of 11. Andrea Perrin talks about her getting raped and murdered by throat cutting in the house. Um, Prudence was not related to the Arnold family that owned the Perrin's family home and never lived there. She was killed by a lover over jealousy. Well, I mean, I highly doubt that it was like a lover by choice. Let me, it's just... Put that out there for the 11-year-old. Maybe. Well, I don't know if she was actually 11, though, either. Ah. Um, But yeah, her throat was slashed, but it was not in the house. She had no relation to the house at all. Um, Lastly, let's talk about this demon, Bathsheba. Bathsheba. (laughs) So the real Bathsheba Sherman Green. um, Bathsheba was, or actually has no ties to the parents' family home as well. Uh, she didn't live or work there. The picture that they have that might have been her, there's no evidence to support that it was her 
And I don't know why she was wearing a surgical mask in that picture. <laughs> well, and then she's not really doing anything wrong in the picture either. No, whoever but, that person is. But, but it's like the picture is like outside. Everything looks fine, but she's wearing a surgical mask for well, some reason. I don't know what year was it. Do we know? I don't know. No, there was always sickness around. Yeah. But she didn't live or work there. She was never brought up on suspicion of murdering her baby. Um, she didn't die by hanging. She died of a stroke. And because of the Warrens and parents' claims, her gravestone has been vandalized several times, and her name is forever shrouded in darkness. Yeah, I think the, the stone's been taken down now, actually, because so many people were messing with it. Yeah, so that's really sad, right? That it part? is, yep. Uh, oh, yeah, and the Norma Sutcliffe, the woman who was with her, or, or the woman with her husband that bought the parents' home um, in 1983, I believe she bought it. Um, and they lived in it the longest of our, mm -hmm. of this current time, um, said that they never saw any spirits there. Andrea Perrin and the Perrin family are the only people that have records of her saying this. Uh, they experienced the door shaking sometimes and their bed shaking, but they believed it was because it was an older house and it was drafty. And that's it. Okay. Jeez. Whew. That yeah. is a lot. Now, the whole thing with the Norma, Norma Sutcliffe, I'd like to postpone that discussion because I bring up bring that up again a little bit um, yeah. just uh, later so we can kind of full discuss that. Okay. Right. But for the rest of it, um, I, you know, I, I, I believe that you're right. Like, the, I don't have any anything um, to say that I read the, this article that you you know you uh, that you looked up yeah. as well, and I think it's well researched. You and you know, will link it in the. Show I will notes, absolutely right? link it in the show notes. Okay. Um, very interesting, and I, I think it's it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know the the research wise. Um, what I will say, it, and it's not uh, anything other than just to say that um, Andrea Perrin, you know, who wrote the books, um. I've l listened to, watched her do more recent interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, she knows this. And, yeah. you know, she talks about how um, this is that she's, you know, yeah, like, the, right. We've now learned that a lot of the history that, you know, she grew up thinking was was real um, is not right. And well, so at least about Beth Sheba. Beth Sheba. Well, she'll talk, so she and she mentioned um, Mrs. John Arnold in the interview I listened to. Um, I say listened to, watched, um, and but said right away. But we have no idea, you know. She said, it, "You know, um, we." And she said, "The reality is, we will never know who these spirits are. You know, we can research and we can try to make guesses, but we really don't know." And to her, it's not the important part that that we get hung up on, like you know. It, that it, the spirit must be this person or that person. Um, I think her mom is the one that really, you know, was hung up on it. And I think it kind of, she just kind of believed that for a while. But, um, you know, for her, it's more about the experience that the, the paranormal is there and the things that happen to them still happen, even if we don't know for sure who the spirits were. Um, I'll give you that too. Uh, I yeah. mean, that's fine. And you know what? I think that these mistakes are honest mistakes. Yeah. Of of hasty research. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to do some fast, quick research. This is, you know, I could see how they were thinking at least. Right. I will but, say the Warrens, though, I feel like they were supposed to be the experts and probably could have done better research at the time. Well, I'm going to say that this shakes the credibility of of Andrea Perrin and the Warrens to me. This to me means that I am questioning everything. Also, I was looking at the timing just like an hour ago. I was just looking at this. I thought, you know, when was the um, when was the script written for this movie? And I I couldn't find out exact dates of the script being written, but I did realize that there was a fourteen year um, studio battle over who got the rights to this. Mm -hmm. so, to the Warren stories. To the Warren stories, yeah. yeah. And um, I remember hearing an interview with Andrea Perrin where she said that Lorraine uh, Warren called them up and said, hey, we want to do this story. And Carolyn um, said that, and this is after they had moved out. Right. And she said that I want time to think about it. 
and uh, she wanted to talk to Roger about it mm-hmm. too. Well, that night, um, while doing laundry, a 200 pound door came and crushed her arm. And um, she believed it was Bathsheba again or whatever mm. and told um, told the Warrens that she didn't want any part of them and she, that they should stop contacting her. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know that that kind of supports the idea, but also it says that there was a there was a battle for the story getting out and the book came out that Andrea um, Perrin wrote, came out in 2011. The movie came out in 2013. My thought is maybe the book was written and maybe she didn't really have as much time to do the research that she needed to do Mm. because she wanted to make some money on the idea of the movie coming out. Well, okay. So let's let's, let's even take this from a non- um, paranormal, right? So let's say something interesting happened to you and yeah. your family as a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was a real interesting story. Some outside people came and helped you guys with it or tried to help you, whatever. And then years later, you you find out that they are trying to sell. It's partly their story, but it's a lot your story um, to make a movie. And they want your permission. And you're like, hey, 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 you know, um, but then, you know, whatever it's going to happen. Cause you know, Hey, they can tell their part anyways. You might be like, well, you know what? I better write out my version of this and get it out before so that everyone oh, sure. knows this is my version of it. Now also maybe, yeah, you could make some money. I mean, if they're going to profit from your story, you better profit from your story, you know? Like, so I don't know. To me, it seems, it doesn't seem, doesn't make it not, it doesn't, uh, to me, it doesn't damage the credibility. You know, so that's your, At you know, all. no, not even, not even 5%. No, to me, it does. I mean, when you get the facts wrong of these kind of stories, especially with ghost stories, we need to be able to say uh, that ghosts were people at some point. In order to do that, we have to prove that they were actual entities, that they existed. And the only way to do that is to put names to them. If we can't do that, how do we know that these are actually ghosts or dead ones? Now, here's the interesting part. If you read some of Andrea's stuff, she has started to talk about how she actually thinks there's a little bit of time travel portal dimension stuff going on in that house, that it's not just ghosts. Well, she also believes that when um, she was like 12 years old or so, uh, that a UFO landed by the house and the aliens came in to talk to her. Now, I have not read that. I have. Okay. I did not find that anywhere in my research, but that's that's interesting. I did, but they came in to talk to her, not to the family. They came in to talk to her. Uh, That's, uh, I will say that knocks the credibility a little bit, though you believe in aliens more than ghosts you've said. Well, I do not believe that they fly around in UFOs (laughs) and land and do these kind of things. I'm sorry for people that do, and I'm willing to listen to those kind of things. I, I don't have enough information to be able to debate that. I mean, who was the guy with the um, the Roswell thing that recently came came out? He was on Joe Rogan's show. Yeah, I forget his I've name. Read his he, name. he just passed away, though. Yeah. No, he didn't, didn't pass he? away. No, oh, okay. No. There was one that did. Um, Anyways, but the, yeah, we'll, but yeah, we'll get to I that I find someday. it interesting, but I still don't have any proof that there is like spaceships that come down now i believe that there could be mm-hmm. aliens and i could be- i i could even take this one step further and could believe that there could be alien life force on the earth uh-huh. but they are not people they are microscopic um things that you know would be on our skin or something like that maybe a bacteria or something okay. this is a touchy subject right now yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I just was realizing, you know what, maybe I, maybe we should address this Norma Sutcliffe thing right now. Because okay. I do have something I want to say. Because part of all of this is that we talk about Andrea. But Andrea is not the only one that tells these stories. Um, the other daughters do as well. Um, yes. Christine's the only one that really refuses to talk a lot. And I, I, I think I've figured out why or what her story I, is. I believe I've figured out yeah, why. Yeah, and I, I think we should just leave it because I don't want to, you yeah. know, that's her story and she she's chosen not to, to talk about it. Um, but, um, you know, the others are very consistent 
you know, as far as like the way they talk about the things that happened to them. Um, but two of the the daughters, I, I watched a video um, Nan- with Nancy and Nancy and Cindy went back to visit the house five years after moving. So they saw Mrs. Sutcliffe. Yeah. And uh, Nancy talked about how when she and Cindy went in the house, um, the, both of them felt like they were, she described it as like, almost like you're in a balloon. Like the air was kind of mm. like thick around her. Okay. Um, and that she heard um, someone say like, oh, you're back. And they were touching her face and her hair. And Mrs. Sutcliffe said to her, oh, wow, something's happening to you right now. I can tell. And she, Nancy was like, and I tried to play it off like, oh no, everything's fine. Everything's totally normal. Um, But Cindy was like, oh yeah, no, I can feel them right now. And then Mrs. Sutcliffe said to them, yes, I've had things happen to me. So has my husband and so have friends that have been over. Um, And then she asked them a lot of questions while they were there, including which bedroom was her mother's. Mm -hmm. And when they told her which one it was, she said, oh, that makes a lot of sense because we've had a lot of stuff happen in the bedroom. So... No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) No, no. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, I guess Cindy and Nancy, but like uh, uh, Cindy felt it was more like they were trying to protect... um, them like when they left they were talking about what happened and that they were trying to be protected whereas um nancy felt like they were hugging and like saying hi we missed you um but anyways i guess for me that story i feel like mrs sudcliffe maybe started denying all this stuff because people started to come and show up at the house you know they wanted to well they actually was- sued uh they sued yeah the- the people behind the making of the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so because, yeah, they said that there were a lot of people, and in that legal document, they claimed that they have not. Right. Uh, also, too, they ran a daycare out of their out of their house for eight years. Daycare out of this house where The Conjuring happened. No stories. They also um, had a class that they were teaching people something. I, I forget what it was about. Nothing, no stories. There's a lot of people that came into this this now pretty big house. Uh, although when you see pictures of it, like it looks like just a cabin or something, like well, a I really think it big depends. long cabin. I think it's a pe- yeah. Th- what angle? It's been built out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, but, so, but there were. So, if you had spirits in your house, are you gonna have a have a child care service there? Well, Are you gonna... I, so I wonder if like, just like the parents though, like it was really active in the first few years. And then once things kind of settle, it wasn't so bad. And they had a lot of good times there. I mean, they stayed for 10 years. It wasn't, it was financial mostly, but it, they, they didn't hate the house. Or the easiest thing to believe is that it's all made up. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that is the easiest, right? I I so I'm gonna say that this entire group of people are all liars. Mm. All yeah. right. Well, I've got some more things to go through. All right. I'm ready to hear your other evidence. Okay. Here we go. So uh, I'm gonna try to get into some of the specifics that the parents claim that they've seen and, okay. and all of that. Um, so first, there were many spirits in the parent home um, that they they claimed to see uh, while they were there. Most of them, as we you kind of mentioned, were friendly or at least not threatening. Sure. Um, you know, there's the one, you know, but uh, I thought I'd mention a few of those. So the first was um, there was a father, son, and dog. I liked it. It was a doggy ghost, a ghost mm, doggy. Although the dog in the... We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Uh, a father, son, and a dog would appear at the top of the stairs and stare straight ahead like Was they were looking out of a window. <laughs> the father, <laughs> son, the dog, the Holy Ghost? <laughs> I, I don't know. Ah, that's good. Um, they would, like, they were looking out of a window. They wouldn't look at the parents. Like, they, it wasn't like they were interacting with them. But um, I thought that was kind of cute. So, what do you think? Um, I would imagine that this was only seen by the younger people I, in the house? Uh, I, I guess I haven't heard of the parents saying anything, but I, I just was heard that they the family would see them, so I don't know who. Okay, well, I, I don't find the credibility of the family to be accurate. Okay. Sorry, I never like I, to call anybody a liar. I understand. But it seems like there's been harm actually caused. So, like, when when it comes to a ghost story, 
I mean, like going to the movies or something like that. Mm -hmm. Is it worth the price of the ticket to go see a movie (laughs) to get scared? Yeah. Yeah, right? It is. And is it worth it to buy a book that would scare you? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. If anyone has any scary book recommendations for me or movie recommendations for me for this next couple months, uh, please email me at RebeccaGhostlyPodcast.com because uh, I need them. I I think I'm going to need some of those things while I have some time. (laughs) But I'm just saying, okay, so those things are worth it, right? It's worth it to pay 20 bucks maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, for to be scared to have that scary story. Mm Mm-hmm. Is it worth it to um, to create a dark legacy around somebody that did nothing wrong? Is it worth it to condemn a person and have people violate their grave? Yeah, no, that's not cool. No, and I don't blame it just on the people that did it. I blamed it on the story that evolved because of this. Mm-hmm. So the credibility of the family, I believe that to them... It's worth it to do something like this because it's money. Mm, okay. So a lot of my, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be around that. Okay. Um, the uh, another spirit, um, the youngest April. This goes back to my ghost story. Yes. Um, says that she had a friend called Oliver Richardson that lived in her closet. Um, she never told her family about the spirit until they were older and Andrea was kind of asking the family about this um, because she was afraid that the family would drive the spirit away. Um, in the movie, I, th- I, my thought is that they took this particular story and then made it into the boy that the youngest daughter sees like in the music box. And then I don't know they yeah. just kind of move, they weaved it into the story. They I called him like. Roy. Yeah. Rory yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, so that's, that's the claim. Okay. So, I'm going to say that uh, a lot of young um, people, a lot of young kids, are going going to have the make make believe friends. And since her mother didn't see this Oliver, nobody else claims to see the Oliver except for in the movie that Lorena saw it. That Lorena has got some power that she can see. Oh, these Lorraine, things. yeah, yeah. Lorraine, I'm yeah. sorry, well, Lorena <laughs> has some power that she can see these things. Um, so she was able to see it, but nobody else was. Besides that, so I'm going to say this is a child's make-believe. Okay. All right, here's here's another one. Okay. So the father, Roger, mm-hmm. claims that uh, he saw a mist or fog come out of the cellar door, which opened on its own while he was sitting in the kitchen eating, and the rest of the family was out buying shoes for the new school year. And he had made sure that they were, because he heard something, so he went and he made sure they were gone and he came back. He was eating. Door opens halfway. This mist and fog comes out. Um, the spirit kind of hung out in the air in the other room like he could see it, but it never approached him. Um, he kind of waited because he he actually wanted and this is we're going to talk about this, but he wanted to see if he could talk to the spirit because this was about three years in. And he said this is when he started to really believe what his wife and the girls were saying and seeing just like you see in all those ghost uh, shows, right? It's always the husband that like is like, psh, 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 you know, to like the, the other people in the house. And then all of a sudden something, psh, <laughs> psha, right. Uh, but then after a while they start, they can't ignore it anymore. So, um, so he wanted to talk with this thing. If it was a ghost after a half hour, he says he got impatient and yelled, just come over here and talk to me or leave if you don't want to. And then she left and he was like super upset because he was like, Oh no, I had an opportunity to talk to a ghost and I made it go away. So then he kind of kept calling for her and trying to get her to come back. And she never really came back like that anymore to him. So I think often about this. um, So we, we are, we, you believe mm-hmm. that ghosts are possible, right? Yes. And you believe that these ghosts can, or that we can see these ghosts, right? Sometimes. Most Sometimes. of the time, no, but... Okay. But for them to see us, too, that's adding another level to this. Mm-hmm. Us, Them to see us, to be able to interact with us, I believe it's so complicated 
for all this to happen in a world that uses physics, uses science. I I don't I don't know what to say about this. I wasn't there. I didn't see the mist. I wish I had saw the mist. I can tell you that I've looked at some of the pictures um, that the Warrens have of this particular time, and I can tell you that these pictures, um, it's usually because of flash. Mm-hmm. The flash wasn't timed out perfectly. It was an external unit that was with the camera. So it would have to, the camera would have to tell it, I'm taking a picture, and then the flash go off, and then the picture being taken. If that's not timed perfectly well, it comes out really weird with weird results. And another time they had a wire that would go um, from the flash to the camera that oftentimes caused problems too. Yeah. Well, this was not a picture though. But I'm just saying, I've seen a lot of evidence surrounding this and I I have to say that there is explanations for everything. I can't give one to this because I wasn't there. I didn't see it. I have no evidence of it besides... Roger. And so do I believe the credibility of Roger? That's the question. No, (laughs) because he's part of the parent family that have made a lot of money off of this story. Mm. Well, I watch. I will say to me in the video, um, when he talked about this, it was, it was emotional. It was, it was interesting. Um, I will also, I was just going to add one more thing here. You can respond to, he also believes that this is the spirit that would touch his back periodically he would feel a hand on his back and then turn around and no one was there okay um and then andrea his daughter believes that that the spirit tormented her mother and would touch roger because she lusted after roger yeah so i don't know you know roger didn't necessarily really seem to think uh, say anything about that other than this particular spirit was definitely drawn to him I mean, let's say that there is several accounts in the family. We're not going to get into specifics of things on a more sexual basis. Right. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. But let's, you know, the family has all spoken about that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, is it one person has this feeling and then they tell somebody and they agree? Like every time... I feel sick and I talk to you. I'm like, man, I have a headache. You're like, I have a headache too. Did you have a headache before I had a headache? Or did your headache, did you just realize you had a headache because I had a headache? It's one of those kind of things. What comes first? I really don't know. Hmm. Yeah. And it's, I guess to me, it, uh, the one thing that I think uh, we were talking about this the other day, like I do feel like the parents, um, invited this in so you know they they wanted to see these spirits as much as they claim there were a lot of bad things that happened initially especially they were not negative except to the mom um and i feel like the when i heard roger talking about this you could tell like he was regretful like he regrets to this day that he didn't get he missed his opportunity to talk to a ghost and so obviously this is a person that um brings the energy to him, you know, that, that, okay. you know, with that belief. I mean, you're going to argue that's why he saw it because he wanted to, but you know, to me, it's him bringing the energy. No, to I'm going to argue not that he wanted to, is that he thought he was supposed to. Mm, gotcha. Everybody else was seeing things. Ah, I see what you're saying. And okay. then, and then, you know, if you see something that could be 50-50 science or paranormal, you're going to lean more towards the paranormal. I get what you're saying then. Okay. All right. It makes it seem like my arguments are all just like, um, you know, it's because people don't believe this way and people, you know, it's... But the, the, the thing is, there are certain circumstances that can cause people to see things and to believe things. A very well-known skeptic, Uh, I do not have permission. He's actually passed away. Um, He he actually had a condition where he had to go into the hospital. And um, the condition got really bad, really fast. And he started to see everyone as aliens. Mm. And this was a skeptic, a full-blown skeptic that would not believe in aliens. Not like me. I kind of can, but 
Um, but so this person believed in that, and it took his partner bringing uh, his wife and his child to the hospital, and once he saw the child, he realized it can't be an alien because this is, you know, this is this kid that I've known, Mm -hmm. and that's what clicked and made him realize it was his mind playing tricks on him. Interesting. But so that is a skeptic saying that. Mm Mm-hmm. If someone has a partial belief, it's it's really easy to to believe these things. I get you. Okay. No, that makes sense. Uh, I understand your argument. Um, okay. I I guess I wanted. I as I said earlier, uh, I think we talked about the 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 seance yes. or the not technically an exorcism, right? Okay. Yeah. Um. So Cindy and Andrea were witnessed to this. They yes. snuck down and saw it. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to see what they claim to have seen. And it uh, wasn't in the cellar. It was in the dining room. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, she said, this is the only time I was truly terrified in that house was that night because she thought she saw her mother die. Um, her mom spoke in a voice that she had never heard before and a power that was not of this world threw her 20 feet across into another room. Um, and actually, Andrea, I read, uh, believe that this caused her mom a concussion and that it, she didn't get over it for a very long time, even just the physical part of it. Um, the mom herself describes the events of that night as dreadful and added that the Warrens tried to help, but we uh, essentially found things got worse. <laughs> and uh, then her father, I guess, was so upset um, by the events of that night that he actually asked the Warrens to leave. So uh, I think you talked about this earlier, you know, yeah. that the the Warrens made it worse than they, it didn't work, basically. Um so I just thought, the, what do you think about that? The the claim that she spoke in a different voice, got thrown across the room, that kind of stuff. Well, these are typical things that people say with an exorcism. So I could see how the movie can portray this as an exorcism, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I believe that there are some medical conditions that can cause people to speak in tongues, um, especially tongues that are not recognizable. And that's what I heard from Andrea when Andrea spoke of the event, that these are not, that this was not languages that she's ever heard on this planet. So it didn't sound like it was Spanish. It didn't sound like it was, you know, Russian. It it sounded like something different. So they could just be made up words then at that point, you know. Um, the throwing 20 feet in the air, I, I, you know, again, I'm not there. I didn't see it. Um, I'd love to believe them. I would love to believe them, but their credibility is shaken, and the Warrens' credibility to me is shaken by the idea that they would, uh, that they would allow something to go out to the public before they've actually researched it fully. Uh, I would never claim that somebody did something that heinous to put a needle in a baby's brain when there's nothing, nothing that substantiates that at all. So my belief is that I I don't have the credibility in the family. I definitely don't have the credibility in the Warrens. I mean, the Warrens take a piece from all their little, you know, investigations to put in their museum that's in their house because... Only in their house can it be protected, but in other people's houses it can't be protected. They they make money. They make a lot of money. People don't realize how much money is in the paranormal. And I was talking to Rebecca about this before we started recording. If I was a believer, or if I pretended to be a believer, this podcast, we would have a lot more fans. We would have a lot more listens. Uh I have no doubt that if I would come come out as a believer and started to preach the word of this, that we could probably quit our day jobs and do this full time. But I can't do that because I am not going to bamboozle anybody. I am. <laughs> there is a good word. I, it is a good word. I am not going to do that because I have faith in hum- humanity. I have faith that we're going to all do the right thing at the right time. And to me, the parent family is not. Mm, okay. 
All right. Well, I'm going to save some of my stuff for the fi- my uh, final argument okay. when it comes to that. I don't want to repeat too much. So, uh, so the girls uh, will move on. The girls also experience things that they couldn't see. I, I put could see in my notes, but it's couldn't see. Um, there are kind of too many of them for us to talk about all of them. So I'm just going to mention a couple. Uh, one is that they smelled a putrid smell that they say smelled like rotting flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, I read in one place they would only smell in the mornings, but everywhere else I saw it said it could be any time they would smell it and then it would go away. Uh, they definitely had this as part of the movie. Yeah, so, they did. They yeah. did. They mentioned it several times. Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, I think that could be any outside influence that's not a ghost. It could be maybe they left a plate of spaghetti on the <laughs> on the dresser. You know, and that, that could for all these years. I don't know about <laughs> that. I'm well. Maybe there's something outside mm. that is causing that. Maybe uh, another was their beds being lifted up off the floor at five fifteen uh, most mornings. So it was like a certain time their beds would get lifted off. Okay, so why don't we have video of this? Well, because it was like early seventies, so yeah. most people didn't necessarily have video. But they lived there for ten years. That was the eighties. And if this was really happening, so by the way, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, James Randi, The Amazing Randi? Yes. So The Amazing Randi uh, started up a research, um, I, I forget what he calls it, but there is a paranormal research group that offered in 1964 $1,000 for anybody that could prove any paranormal activity. And all it had to be was observed by a member of the whatever, James Randi Foundation for whatever. Uh, It just had to be observed, and they had to be able to prove that it was legit. And uh, that $1,000 over the years jumped up to $1 million, and nobody has ever claimed this prize. Nobody has ever successfully been able to demonstrate a paranormal activity that's real ever I, you know it's one of those things I, you know it's it's a double ed, it's a it's a it's an impossible situation what is that when it's like an impossible force meets an immovable object or whatever it's called science well here's the that's thing what that is. well no because here's the other part of it right so we also know that mrs sudcliffe you mentioned this earlier claimed that the beds moved but said, she said totally they, explainable. They shook, yeah. they shook and said totally explainable just because it's an old house, beds move. But this wasn't levitating in the air though. Well, but maybe to a little girl, it was, you know, it moving, they felt it was being lifted up. Whatever. They didn't see it necessarily. All right, then I'm gonna use the old house thing for my right. explanation. <laughs> Thank well, you. But, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is to me is that I, 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 you know, when a believer sees something versus when a non-believer sees something, they're going to look at it in a different way. So if I'm this amazing Randy guy and I'm there in the room and I see this happen, I'm just going to be like, whatever, it was the house moving. Whereas then when the girls say, yeah, but every, like it happens often and it always happens at this time uh, and it happens to all of us, you know, at different times or different days or whatever, whatever it was, like that doesn't seem likely and did anything else move? You know what I mean? It's like, but again, you're going to see what you want to see. So if you want to believe, you're going to see it as a believe thing. If, you want, if you're a non-believer, you're going to see it as a non-believer thing. And never the twain shall meet. Actually, what's, what's funny about me is I typically start off going, oh my God, that had to have been this. But then after I get away from the situation, then I have time to process and then I change my mind. Yeah, you've had some freaky stuff happen to you. Well, maybe one day we'll talk about that. <laughs> well, you've, you've already talked about some of them. Yeah, but there's more. Oh. There's a lot more. That's so crazy. Okay, all right. <laughs> you ready for, uh, I think, the last couple here. We want to talk about the movie. Okay. Uh, so the movie itself um, had a few th- creepy things that happened. Some of uh, you know, some of them were things that the family claimed. So I just I wanted to go more with the director and the crew. Um, actually, the director and the writers. Okay. Okay. Um, So director James Wan uh, was working on uh, a shooting script in his home office before filming started. And his Maltipu, Maltipu, 
That's the cutest yeah, the name dog. ever. Puppy. Uh, Lana reacted to an unseen presence. Um, she would, quote, she would stare at the corner of the office and make this really l- low growl, Juan told the Daily News. She would just be growling away and she would just be tracking whatever this thing is across my office, just looking at it, following it. She did this many, many nights in a row and it just freaked me out. So what I'm going to say about that is one of the biggest times that I noticed something like this was I uh, was dating a girl that was into horses and uh, she would, you know, in the stable, they would ride the horses. Uh, She was against the whole like jumping the horse and doing these weird things because like I found out that that's actually not good for the horse to do in some degree. I don't know. But anyways, the horses would get spooked sometimes. Not at the same spot like like every single horse would get spooked at this one spot. Randomly, they would just get spooked. Horses have to wear those things to cover up the side Yeah, the view, blinders, yeah. The blinders because they get spooked so much. They just freak out for no reason. And that has caused people to die mm-hmm. because they've thrown people off. Uh, I, I hate to say die and kind of be smiling a little bit with that. I don't know why I was. But anyways... um. I believe that we have no idea what this kind of thing is, this connection with dogs and 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 cats and other animals with anything else out there. We have no proof of anything. It's never been scientifically proven that, yes, dogs, cats, other things can see into other dimensions or see spirits or see aliens. Oh, we're going to we're going to explore this more in a future episode. Maybe. Maybe. Well, no, actually, I guess it's a little different what we're going to do. But yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So um, I actually want to go to um, not the next one, but the next one. Okay. So we're going to we're talking about um, the some uh, Chad and Carrie Hayes. Okay. Who, who also wrote the, the super screenplay. Um, so Carrie Hayes says he started uh, it all started when the writers would call Lorraine Warren to discuss the 4000 cases she investigated with her late husband. Their conversations would be interrupted by strange bursts of static on the line that sounded like a cascade of angry whispers, judging by his brother's reenactment. Um, it was not something wrong with the line. You'd like to say that, but it's not. Warren, now 85, told the news, uh, when something like this happens, I'm a Christian. I bless myself. I say, uh, I'll say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. And the static gets better. Um, and I wanted to bring this up. I don't remember if I talked about it in the episode, but when I was doing research for the uh, exorcism episodes, um, we had a, uh, I read about a possession case where the priest would have this happen when he was talking to this woman who claimed to be possessed that there would be this weird static on the line. So I just thought that was super creepy. So they're talking to Lorraine, weird static. She blesses it. Static gets better. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> Static over a line. I mean, if every time I had static over a line, if I thought that was paranormal, then I would truly be the biggest believer in the world because uh, I have AT and T, and there's a lot of static all the time. I don't have that. Uh, I've talked to you on the phone, and there's been static. Well, that was that has to do with my car. But what about if it has to do with their car? What if it has to do with Lorraine's car? But what if, if it's it has just to do when they're with... talking with this one person. So maybe it's her. <laughs> well, again, I, I also picked it because there was, I've read about other incidents. So, okay. all right. Well, anyways, but you, I, I assume, so it could be the car or the phone. Yeah. It could be anything, right? Mm, okay. Could be that they, that someone drove into a dead zone or they walked slightly further. You know, if we're talking cell phones, if we're talking landlines, could be the cord itself on the phone. I, you know, on, on my work phone, which is a landline, for another couple of weeks because <laughs> uh, we're getting all like voice over IP stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, if I, you know, if I move the cord wrong, I get static. Okay. And it could be that I'm in this conversation with this person that takes a while. So I maybe pace back and forth as I'm talking or something. Right. Who knows? But then once it's blessed, it goes better. Yeah. I never heard a blessing a phone. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, that's all I got for you. The one thing I want to say, though, is during the movie, I found the most interesting point is that they weren't going to do an exorcism on 
a person, they were going to do it on the location. Well, they were going to, yeah, that was weird. It was, I, I thought it was like th- a blessing, but no, they said exorcism. But I never thought of that yeah. in terms of something that could be done. And that's, that's an interesting thought. That I is an interesting say. thought. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that brings us to the closing arguments. This is our last chance to convince you to vote our way. We are each given one minute of uninterrupted time. We will time each other on our cell phones to keep each other honest. All right. Are you ready, Rebecca? Uh, sure. All right, and go. All right. I believe that the Perrin family home is haunted. Um, it's, a, it's from the 1700s. Yeah, lots of stuff's happened there over the years. Maybe we don't know who, when, where, what, but there is a lot of energy in that house. There's a lot of creepiness happening in that house, and the parents have been talking about it since the 70s. Um, I, you know, I, and I understand why Andrea decided to do a collective memoir, is what she calls it at some point, um, to, to write it all down. We have met, and I have met people over the years that uh, um, have had a, lived in a haunted home, and then the family almost like doesn't even talk about it until they're older. I mean, these guys, you know, they did talk about it at the time, but um, really interesting. Uh, There's too many stories, too much um, uh, of people kind of saying the same things. I think the Warrens are, they are a little shaky. I'm going to say that. I love Lorraine Warren. She seemed like such a sweet person, Um, but I believe him. All right. So that was your one minute. That was my one minute. All right. Are you I'm, ready? I am definitely ready. Born ready. All right. Here we go. And go. I think it's irresponsible what they've done. And I don't want to just uh, go ahead and brush that off as as if it's nothing. They have caused the desecration of a grave of somebody that was completely innocent. They have made people think that this name represents pure evil. They have been irresponsible in their research. They are uncredible to me. They do not... What they say then means nothing to me. Also, Andrea, in her book, has changed stories a couple times. You said that they they always stay fast to what they are talking about, and they always remain with it. They don't. They change stories sometimes depending upon what they need and depending upon what they hear. And they make it seem like it's no big deal. They have caused somebody that died of innocent causes to be devil-fied. Devil-fied? <laughs> <laughs> nice. That is definitely a new word going to enter the uh, the ghostly lexicon. Yes. All right. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys so much for listening. Please share us with your friends and family as word of mouth is our best advertisers. Rebecca, where can they find us on Facebook? Uh, Ghostly Podcast. So they just do a search for Ghostly Podcast? Yeah, Ghostly Podcast. Or if you really like to type, you could put facebook.com slash ghostly podcast. You could do that too. What about on the Twitter and on the the Instagram? Ghostly Podcast. At Ghostly Podcast. At Ghostly Podcast. That's it. That's Where can they need. find our website? The ghostlypodcast.com. What could they email if they have a story to tell you? Info at ghostlypodcast.com. I'm seeing a pattern here. There is a pattern. Ghostlypodcast.com. That's where to go. Uh, so I have to disrupt what we usually do <laughs> at the end of every episode. You're being so sneaky. We are not going to be telling you what the topic of the next episode is going to be. It's a mystery topic, and that will come out on April first of twenty twenty. Yes, so you know we're gonna we're gonna keep that under wraps. Yeah, <laughs> but until next time, stay ghostly. Bye. <laughs>